Hey, my name is Ann Spencer. And if you are listening or watching for the first time, I'm a product person. And in a prior life, I had the absolute delight of meeting Pete Warden and becoming his editor. And over the past 10 years or so, we've had so many conversations about data and the industry. And we recently decided to record some of our chats. Yeah, and I'm Pete Warden. Um, I like to say that I've been doing AI since before it worked. Um, and yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, all the chats I've had with Anne. So this is a great chance to share them. For sure. So I have email alerts set up. So every time you write a blog post, I get an alert, right? Which I thoroughly like that to keep track of what's going on. So I was very really happy to see the most recent blog posts that, that you've written. And for folks who are watching or listening and haven't had a chance to read the blog post or read the paper or visit the GitHub yet, we're going to be talking about Moonshine today. So Moonshine is a family of speech to text models for live translation and voice command recognition, particularly for resource constrained devices like microprocessors and microcontrollers. Now, when I was reviewing the artifacts, you know, because I am that person that likes to kind of parse through everything, I think what stood out for me was how Moonshine is faster than Whisper. That, that kind of stood out, right? Um, and that's due to Moonshine leveraging a transformer architecture, as well as rotary position embedding, also known as Rope. Rope helps provide flexibility for sequence length. And this matters in particular for Moonshine because Moonshine is trained on speech segments without zero padding. And this results in greater efficiency. It also allows its compute requirements to scale with the length of the input audio. Now, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I can definitely speak for myself and some of the live translation experiences you know, I find myself a beat or two behind what's going on, and that's due to latency in the translation, right? It can create a sense of being out of sync or cognitive dissonance, and that's due to that latency in the translation. So when I was reading through the artifacts, I thought, okay, I get it. Like, I get and I see the value of this. Like, it decreases latency and therefore, like, improves the overall live translation experience. And I definitely have some questions, because I always do. <laughs> so why don't we start out with the name right <laughs> so what's what's with the name, <laughs> like what's so, the name? it's funny this is uh this is actually the name uh was uh like so manjana my co-founder and cto of useful sensors he's the one who's done all the heavy lifting on you know sort of driving this project forward and he came up with the name uh moonshine fairly early on when we realized we needed um a better alternative to Whisper. Um, and our first approach was really, okay, let's start off as simple as we can. Let's actually try distilling Whisper. There's a project out there called Distill Whisper, which is, you know, a great project. Um, and we wanted to sort of experiment with that and see, you know, see what we could do. Um, we ended up actually uh, having to build our own data set um, and completely uh, build an entirely new model from scratch. But we liked the name Moonshine, which comes from uh, distilling uh, alcohol <laughs> um, so much that, uh, you know, the name that uh, we had at the start kind of uh, stuck. Um, and yeah, it's been Moonshine to us ever since. That happens a lot, actually. <laughs> external code names become the external names. You're like, oh, we're just going to go with it. Yeah. Just remember it. Right. Um, so what sparked the development for Moonshine itself? Like, why this particular problem? Out of all the problems to choose from, right? Why this particular problem? Well, I think you touched on it a bit when you were talking about, you know, translation and the latency. Um, but in general, and, you know, converting audio into the text of what somebody said uh, is a really fundamental building block of so many different ways of interacting with computers from translation to voice control to captions for accessibility um, and my vision has always been uh, i really want to have a 50 cent device that can do full speech recognition uh, and run on a coin battery for a year. Um, and that way, anything that has a switch or a button can have a voice control too. So taking that fundamental capability of actually understanding what people are saying 
um, and trying to reduce the compute requirements, both so it can fit on much smaller and cheaper devices and so be more ubiquitous, be a lot easier to add to things, um, but also to reduce the latency of the response because one of the ways I've found it sometimes helps to get this across is if you imagine you had a keyboard where you press a key and then two seconds later the key shows up on screen <laughs> that would be super frustrating um but that's kind of where we're at with speech is you know we're just so happy generally it's so new and it's so exciting just to be able to get somewhat accurate transcriptions of what we're saying uh, there hasn't been much focus or much research on getting that latency down to really get that interactivity and that uh, usability improved. So it was this idea of, okay, Whisper is a fantastic step forward. It's an amazing model. I'm so happy and impressed that they actually released it because uh, it's the first open source model that's really, really um, comparable to the models that we had internally at Google and the other people like, you know, a few other big corporations like Apple and Amazon uh, have actually developed with like hundreds of engineers over, you know, decades. Um, so having Whisper be this thing that anybody could use w was a real game changer. But we ran into the limitations of, oh, you have to feed in 30 seconds of audio at a time. And you pay in compute and memory and everything else costs for that 30 seconds. Even if you just only want to do five seconds or three seconds, um, so that was really the big motivation behind us realizing that oh okay we actually have to there's no model out there that can do what we need we're gonna have to build it ourselves yeah you also mentioned aspects of building blocks and i feel like that's a lot of what you're doing and when i was reading through the paper i was reading about the data sets that you decided to use right and um in my prior roles there's always been conversations about what data sets to train and test on right and sometimes they can feel endless endless conversations so, <laughs> so i feel like i'm channeling people who are listening right now and who are thinking about and processing moonshine for their own applications and use cases and i think it would help them if you could unpack the process the team went through in terms of why they decided um to choose the data sets you did right and that's like common voice and my corpus liver speech and people speech like why those particular data sets uh, yeah, and to be clear, those are some of the data sets we used. We also okay. gathered a lot of um, data from the public web. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that's really interesting, and one of the reasons that I think Whisper was such a big step forward, is a lot of the published data sets tend to be fairly formal speech. Um, so there often be things like people reading from books which mm -hmm. is very well enunciated. Uh, mm -hmm. People will pause. Uh, there isn't usually much background noise. Um, it's usually in a, you know, not in a colloquial form. There isn't much, uh, you know, a slang. Um, and that's why a lot of the models that are trained purely on these, um, these, data sets actually struggle to work well in kind of the real world because most of the audio that they're actually going to encounter is a lot more loose and informal um, so that's where supplementing those uh, data sets with ones that are actually uh, you know data that's pulled from the public web um, is really important because that tends to be a lot less formal a lot mm -hmm. more uh, like the way that we speak when we're not narrating a book, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, it's actually a lot um, uh, uh, very important to be able to train on that kind of speech if you want to be able to understand that kind of speech. Um, so that's how I'd sort of characterize, like, it's great. I'm a, you know, I published the Google Speech Commands data set um, years ago for, like, short, utterances and I love seeing these open data sets they're really important but it turns out that to actually get a good speech model you also need just a, a large amount of really um, uh, realistic 
audio data. That makes complete sense. And, you know, one of the things I love about your blog post is that you're always end on inspiration or excitement, right? No, no matter no matter what you're talking about, no matter how much you stir the pod. Right? <laughs> and, and this blog post is, is no different. So at the end of it, you mentioned how you can't wait to see what people are going to build with these new models, right? So what are you envisioning? What are you hoping for? Like, um, that so, people do with this? Uh, you know, one of the things I'd really like to see is just making captioning a an achievable technological mm -hmm. goal for a lot more situations. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping I've actually been poking around with the Onyx runtime web version to see if we can actually run Moonshine in the browser um, and, you know, then potentially for if we're having a discussion like this, you could actually have a browser plugin that gives you instant captions for everything we're saying. And so for just for accessibility reasons, for, you know, being able to do interesting stuff with the data analysis, um, actually unlocking all this audio data out there and making it much cheaper to be able to treat it as, you know, real information versus just this kind of soup of audio samples. I, I think that there's a whole um, bunch of really interesting things. And like I said, I, I just feel like it's it should be just like having a keyboard, having a voice interface, or having a touch screen. Like it should just be something that's available to be used when it makes sense. And I'm hoping this is a step towards that kind of universal um, accessibility for this kind of stuff. But I'm curious, like, you know, when you read the paper, what sort of things were you, you know, what sort of use cases leapt out at you? Well, I think what leapt out for me was definitely the live translation. And I'm also that person that actually puts on the captions all the time when I'm watching YouTube videos. I am yeah. so that person. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Because it helps me, you know, just process, right? And I think I would prefer something like this versus um some of the other translation stuff i've seen right and that like i would love to have something like this during meetings as long as the companies are okay with it being recorded and having a transcription yeah. kind of service right because that helps me process what's going on in the meetings because i'm such a text-based processor so helping that back up when that's going on is so useful for me right um I also work with a lot of international teams and in a prior role, I worked with people all over the world. So I think something like that would also help in terms of helping them feel more confident about what's going on in the conversation as a backup, right? Yeah. For sure. But we're almost at time. So yeah. <laughs> just any last thoughts before we sign off on our most recent episode? No, uh, no, thanks again, Anne, for helping set this up. It's been really fun and uh, looking forward to the next one. Yep, looking forward to the next one. Okay, bye everyone.